there is a, a there's a long tradition of American democracy, and it's worth remembering what it was. Uh, the United States is is the country to look at if you want to understand what modern industrial democracy means. It has it is I. It's fair to call it the most free country in the world, the most democratic country in the world. It has the most stable, long-standing democratic institutions. They go way back. They've been resilient and so on. So it's about as good a model of the ideal case, if you like, of uh, capitalist industrial democracy, and therefore worth studying quite carefully. I mean, quite apart from the fact that we happen to live in it, so we're interested, and it's by far the most powerful country in the world, so it matters a lot what, what it's like. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting history. Uh, you should study about it, in my view, in junior high school, but at least in uh, you know, graduate school political science courses, but it's not really much study. Uh, the place to look at the nature of American democracy, the obvious place to look, is in the Constitutional Convention, the debates on the Constitutional Convention, which laid out the framework of what became American democracy, and they're interesting. Uh, they're not much read. What people usually read is the Federalist Papers. I'm sure you've read those. But the Federalist Papers are a misleading source. The Federalist Papers were propaganda, remember. Uh, they were written in order to convince uh, the public, who didn't like what was happening much, to convince them to accept the new constitutional system. So when you read the Federalist Papers, you're reading a kind of a watered-down version, a prettified version of the thinking that was going on. In the, in the debates on the Constitutional Convention, it's much clearer, uh, and they're interesting. The main framer, as you know, was James Madison, who was uh, at the sort of libertarian end and a very intelligent uh, and lucid uh, uh, analyst and exponent of his views, and his views largely prevailed. I mean, there was very little opposition to them at the end. Uh, he was quite clear on what he was doing. Uh, the model that they were everyone had in mind, of course, is England. That was the most democratic existing society of the day, so they were sort of, mo and the one, you know, their mother country. Uh, so they were, they were asking, well, you know, what about the British parliamentary system? And there were debates about whether to accept it or modify it or whatever. Uh, Madison pointed out that uh, the British system would have problems if they tra uh, transferred it over here. Uh, and that is because the United States, they did want to make it, he did, he and other the other founding fathers, as they're called, did want to make it a more participatory and democratic society. But he said a democratic society has a serious flaw. The flaw is that in a democratic society, the people can participate. And he said, suppose what would, suppose, he said, suppose this were to take place in England. I suppose, for example, in England, that they really allowed people to vote, which they didn't. He said, well, the first thing people would do would be to uh, call for what we nowadays call agrarian reform. That is, they would call for changes in the land laws, which would grant more people access to the highly privatized and centralized land system. And that, you know, land was a crucial part of the economy then. And he says, well, we obviously can't accept that. You know, we don't want to have any system that will allow people to participate and infringe on the rights of private property and wealth. Uh, so therefore, we have to be careful not to allow a democratic system in which things really function democratically. We have to make design a system in which power is in the hands of uh, uh, the wealth of the nation, I'm quoting, the more capable set of men, uh, those who uh, are sympathetic with the rights of property. Okay, they must have the power, and the rest must be dispersed and factionalized in such a way that they don't really interfere uh, with the rights of power. Uh, actually, Madison, who was no fool, uh, recognized that this problem was going to become greater as time went on, as he put it, uh, if I can read my own notes, uh, he said there's going to be an increase in the proportion of the population that labors under all the hardships of life and secretly sighs for a more equal distribution of its blessings. Okay, there's going to be an increase in that, and if those people really have an ability to participate, they're going to do things which will infringe on the right of private power. And, and private property and the wealthy, and therefore we have to design the system so that doesn't happen. And indeed, the system was designed so that that wouldn't happen. That was the role of the Senate, was to represent the wealth of the nation. 
and the role of the separation of powers and so on and so forth. Um, how well it functioned, you can argue, it's an interesting question, but uh, it's worth noticing that this idea about the nature of uh, democracy has a long, this, this problem in the nature of democracy, you know, that namely if people can vote, they're going to vote in their own interests and uh, infringe on the rights of private power and wealth. That goes, that insight goes way back, it goes back to the origins of political theory. Uh, so you read the first major book on political theory in something like our sense, Aristotle's Politics, uh, that's a core question of Aristotle's politics. Uh, Aristotle distinguishes tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy, and has a long, elaborate discussion of each, and favors democracy. He didn't think it was perfect, but he favored democracy as the best system. Uh, for him, a democracy meant, it was very straightforward, it meant uh, a community of equals, uh, or to be precise, free men who are equals, and that phrase, free men, is rather <coughs> crucial, but put that aside for a moment, a community of free men who are equal and participatory. Uh, and uh, if, unless it's equal and they can't be seriously participatory, uh, he noticed the same problem that Madison did, he, exactly the same problem. He said, suppose that you did have a democracy where everyone participated, but you had radical inequality, so concentration of wealth. He said, well, then the poorer part of the population, which is the majority, uh, will use their voting power uh, to, for their own interests, uh, to advance their own interests, instead of the common good of all, okay? And the goal of a democracy for Aristotle was to advance the common good of all. But if you had inequality, radical inequality, well, yeah, the majority of the population would vote for their own interests, which would not be the common good of all. So therefore, he had to do something about that. It's the same problem that, that Madison faced, you know, exactly the same problem. Uh, but they reached opposite conclusions. Uh, Madison's conclusion was that we should reduce democracy uh, so that you don't get the threat from the population. Aristotle's was the opposite. You should reduce inequality. Uh, so therefore the problem won't arise. And it'll be a, you could have a real participatory democratic system. So uh, Aristotle called for what we today would call a welfare state. Uh, he said that a democracy must be based on use of public revenues to ensure lasting prosperity for everyone. Uh, welfare state, in other words. Uh, and then he describes in some detail how you could proceed to do that in Athens, do it differently here, but the same kinds of questions. Uh, and then if everyone had moderate but sufficient income, you wouldn't have this problem that both he and Madison faced. But notice that their choices were radically different. One choice was to aim for equality and participation in democracy. The other, the one on which our country was founded, was to reduce the threat of democracy, maintain the inequality, uh, and uh, ensure that power remains in uh, the Senate, you know, the capable class of men, the wealthy part of the, you know, the wealthy part of the society. That's now internationalized. So this huge financial capital that's flowing around the world is sometimes called by international economists a virtual senate, meaning it has the power to ensure, if you really liberalize capital, to ensure that no country will be able to undertake social policies that strike at the interests of the wealthy. Because if any country moves in that direction, the capital quickly flows out of it and the country goes down the tube. So it's a virtual senate you know, kind of a generalization of Madison's Senate. Uh, and the opposite of the Aristotelian conception of democracy is necessarily based on a welfare state and equality. Uh, to go back to that word free men, uh, a democracy for Aristotle meant men, you know, not women, uh, and free, not slaves, you know, or aliens. So it's a subpart of the population, but it's a little hard to dump on Aristotle for that, since given that those questions weren't even addressed and badly addressed until this century, you know, and still are far from addressed. Uh, but that's a significant qualification. But the principles are there, and they come right up to the present. Uh, it's also been understood, and uh, by now it's and this this battle, sort of struggle up and back between the two conceptions of democracy is a large part of modern history, major theme of modern history.